Well, hello, this is Peter Combs from Bitamount.com and P.L. Combs Asian Art and BitamountLive.com in Gloucester, Massachusetts. And today is Friday, July 16th, 2021. And this is our weekly video. Take a look, see what's been going on in the auction market over the last week in the Chinese and the Asian world in general and some little bits of news here and there. Um, it, it was kind of a quiet week last week on eBay and Katowiki, as I mentioned. The, and if you got the newsletter last week, there wasn't a heck of a lot in there. It's changed. This week, there's going to be quite a lot in there. So I, I want you to check it out, and we'll go over some of the items that appeared. But one of the things I wanted to talk about before I got going today was uh, I've always had an interest in, in, in Chinese carvings, as many of you know. I like wood carvings of all kinds, uh, horn carvings, ivory carvings, a lot of the taboo carvings, I guess, today because of the raw materials you used to make them, uh, primarily rhino horn and uh, ivory. But I wanted to share something uh, with all of you because I, I've always liked rhino horns enormously. And a number of years ago, uh, about six, seven years ago, we were involved with the appraisal of a rhino horn um, in an estate collection. And at the time, we, we begged the people to sell it because uh, uh, the laws were changing at that time fairly rapidly. As some of you know, I testified uh, before the Massachusetts House and Senate on, on a total of four different occasions on the subject. And uh, the, the, the new laws that were being proposed were pretty much shelved, but uh, the heavy restrictions remained in place. And since then, Sotheby's, Christie's, Bonham's, all the major auction houses have suspended any auction of uh, carved rhino horn and ivory, period, end of discussion. And uh, it's kind of heartbreaking because I'm going to share something with you. Um, uh, a few years ago, as I said, we had the opportunity to uh, appraise a horn in a collection, and it was very much like this one. Um, uh, this is an extremely rare hundred boys type horn, but a late, Ch late Ming, early Qing example. Spectacularly well carved, as you can see. It sold for about $4 million at the time when this sold. Absolutely a stupendous piece of horn. Uh, uh, beautifully done, lots of detail, very, very nice. And I remember when this sold about 11 years ago, I thought, boy, I'll never see anything as nice as this. Well, <laughs> famous last words. Um, we were called to help out with this appraisal, and um, I'm going to show you the picture of the horn that we came across. And uh, and because of the changes in the laws, it, it can't be sold today. Now, this one brought 25 million Hong Kong uh, back in May of 2010, which is uh, roughly uh, three, three, three or so million dollars, three and a half million dollars, I guess. This is the horn that we came across in a collection sitting on a shelf. Um, it, it was in a cabinet that hadn't been opened probably for 40 years. As a matter of fact, the, the cabinet locks had to be fixed to get it open, and the pieces in the cabinet, this and a, uh, a, a rhino horn a, a Buddha figure from the Wan Li period was also present. But this, this uh, cup was in that cupboard, and uh, absolutely breathtaking. And as you notice uh, right here, it is uh, inscribed with a poem on this side, and then there's a signature on the other side, meticulously detailed. The inside of it is filled with relief work, chimeras. You can see some of them coming over the top here, and they continue down into, into the inside of the piece. And uh, this was sort of a lesson learned. Uh, at the time, I remember saying to the people that the laws are changing and that if you wish to sell it, uh, I would really recommend you look into it right now. Get it done, get it out of the way, do it as quickly as possible. Um, the major auction houses would have jumped at the chance to sell this and it would have been no problem at all. And uh, they procrastinated, unfortunately, and got back in touch with me around a year ago and said, okay, we're ready to sell the horn. And as many of you know, uh, isn't going to happen. We tried a few different venues. We talked to different people. We talked to some auctioneers in Europe and uh, to do it all legally, of course. Uh, the family has loads of documentation. It was listed in a will in, uh, in the 1930s. It was acquired in China in the early part of the 1900s. Um, lots of uh, information about its origins and, and, their, and the entire Chinese collection within this family. And it's just a matter of uh, no auction house will touch it. And uh, the shipping it to the uh, interested markets is, is so restricted these days, it just isn't worth doing. So uh, it's a sad thing, and maybe someday the uh, laws will change, people will come to their senses and recognize these things as art and uh, allow them to be once again sold on the marketplace. But for now, this horn has basically uh, n uh, no value, um, down from 
Um, I, we had appraised it at a minimum of you know 700,000 or so, and I thought maybe it could bring a million, and uh, it probably could have, probably could have brought maybe two million at one point. But uh, as for now, it, it sits in its glory being what it is, and, and I hope the family uh, enjoys it and takes good care of it and appreciates it for what it is, even though it has very modest um, uh, financial value uh, at the current uh, time. It's too bad. But at any rate, it's sort of a little lesson learned for everybody. Strike while the iron is hot if you're thinking of selling something. All right, and uh, that's so much for that. Now, um, on from that from that uh, rather odd thing on to uh, what's been going on on the internet. Uh, one of the things that happened yesterday, there was a sale down at Eldred's on Cape Cod. I think some of you are watching it. They had some dishes and things there uh, from the Thomas uh, Tom with the Thomas Jefferson monogram on them. And the items came from a collection here on the North Shore, and I'm very familiar with this collection because I'd, we had, over the years, had done a lot of work for this particular family. <clears throat> the uh, mansion that they lived in was this place, it was up in uh, the uh, uh, Coolidge Point Reservation. It was donated to Historic New England. And when Historic New England decided they actually don't, they can't use it, and they're, they're going to sell the property and uh, uh, use the money for their, for their programs. Originally, it was going to be sort of their headquarters. Uh, there's another area here called the Coolidge Reservation. It's a massive property. These are the people that are, uh, are descendants of, of, of Thomas Jefferson. And uh, it's an absolutely amazing house. I've been in it many, many, many times. And uh, there are things in that house. And one of the things that were in the house, the great art from this collection has been kept and has gone elsewhere. But they sold a lot of the sort of odds and ends, they call it, uh, at, at the uh, uh, sale at Eldridge yesterday. It did very well. brought a lot of money. One of the things that brought a lot of money was this blue and white jar, which is a bit of a mystery to me and a lot of other people right now. It went for $160,000. <clears> now, I had looked at this jar um, uh, back in uh, uh, oh, probably 20 years ago um, at the house and uh uh, it was our opinion that this jar is a 19th century example. And uh, during that same time period, the owners uh, uh, brought in other people to look at it. This had been passed down through the family. It had been inherited uh, from around, uh, it was acquired back around, I think, around 1900 or 1910 or something like that by the family. And uh, they had uh, the uh, Chinese expert from uh, Christie, uh, not from Christie's, from the Museum of Fine Arts come out and look at it. They said 19th century jar. Uh, I know one of the major auction houses had seen it, and they said 19th century, no doubt about it. And uh, to their credit, Eldred's listed it as 19th century. Here's a picture of the bottom of it. It's a, exactly what a 19th century bottom of a jar looks like and so forth. And uh, Eldred's put it in as a 19th century jar, <clears throat> and it went for $160,000. Uh, sort of a shock. Um, uh, we were sort of waiting um, to hear um, what the story was with this. It's one of those odd things. A few a month or two ago, we had the complete fake that sold for three hundred sixty thousand, and now we have this uh, evidently nineteenth century jar by everybody's accounts, bringing one hundred and sixty thousand. All right, so it's a crazy world we live in, and uh, it'll be interesting to hear if uh, this sale actually goes through. Uh, it's a it's a very nice jar. It's very finely done. Here's an underside of the lid. Um, what it looks like, uh, they, they provided lots of pictures, so nobody can accuse them of being stingy on pictures. Here's the, uh, the, the, the top of it. Here's the foot rim of it. Uh, this uh, foot here to uh, no one looks uh, Kang Shi that I'm aware of. Uh, they had some very nice other Chinese porcelain in this collection years ago, but long gone, and uh, so forth. So um, we'll see what happens there. But that was just one of those crazy things that happens when it went from an estimate of uh, 400, high of 450 to over $160,000 in, in, in a matter of about five minutes. And there you go. All right. Other things that were sold, this was the uh, Casco Bay sale. We talked about this. We had, remember, it had the teapot in it with the fish on it I, I like so much. And this was another piece that was in that sale. Now, this was a nice New England auction. Casco Bay ran a nice New England auction. They had everything from American furniture to carpets to odds and ends, pictures, prints, engravings, China trade, all the stuff you expect to see in a real classic sort of upper uh, income uh, uh, collection uh, from the uh, you know, 18th, 19th century uh, American stuff. And uh, this was, of course, a China trade teapot in grisaille decoration, uh, very nicely done. 
uh, uh, good looking pot. It looked to be in good shape. Minor nick maybe on the end of the spout and a little bit of wear to some of the decoration, but nothing significant. And it went for $650, which I think was very reasonable. I think the estimate was very conservative. And I think that was a perfectly good buy. And here's that little teapot with the fish on it that I, we commented on last week, also 18th century. Just loved it. Loved the fish. Thought it was terrific. And somebody picked this up, I think, very reasonably, okay? Now, it does, it does appear maybe it had some sort of gilt repair in here. I don't care. Uh, it's the fish decoration that I think is just terrific in the ink work and the way it was done. Nice looking handle and spout. Very, very typical. So there, was a, there was a hairline in the handle there but unusual, sold for $800, all right? This was a nice auction. Uh, if those are a lot, of, some of you out there like these country auctions, I see them all the time and I always say, boy, it'd be fun to talk about the whole auction a bit more than just the Chinese stuff. And if that's, some, I'm trying to think of things that you, uh, some of you folks would like to see uh, more of um, outside of just Chinese things, cause, because I'm pretty familiar with most areas of antiques. And uh, I was thinking it might be fun to discuss other auctions that are coming up interesting auctions, auctions of actual estates, auctions of really good collections that were built up over many, many years uh, by a thoughtful eye, somebody that did a lot of research, did their work, and uh, built something uh, worth uh, appreciating, uh, or just nice general collections of Americana, French furniture, English furniture, uh, you know, all kinds of art from other cultures. And we, we can get into that if, if, if there's a positive response to the idea. Let me know. Let me know what you think of it. All right. Uh, but anyway, because man does not live by porcelain alone. And uh, there's there's a lot of interesting stuff out there. We talk a bit about carpets and so forth and other things. And uh, uh, there's a wide range of uh, really wonderful decorative arts out there that are worth attention. OK, now, uh, what was the next thing here that sold? Um, oh, these. This was a great buy. These were Sun Kwa watercolors um, of, of Chinese gouaches, you know, of, of insects. And this was, I want to get, get rid of that just for a second. This was um, at Freeman's in New York, I mean, in Pennsylvania. This was terrific. These sold on July 14th. This, I think, was a great buy, a great buy for $2,400, okay? You got 12 of these things, 200 bucks a piece. But these are superb, absolutely superbly well-painted, uh, in, framed insect watercolors. And I believe they had, the, according to the description, the unpith, and they had the Sun Kwa labels on them, which means uh, the, the, these are the best of the best. And the fact that they're all insects, I think, is really interesting. It's a very rare subject matter to find on these. Flowers are very typical. Um, uh, interior scenes, of course. Then you have occupational scenes, which are the most common things you're going to find on pith paintings. Um, but but these were absolutely wonderful, all framed and ready to go. You got you have two thousand bucks worth of framework here easily. And uh, somebody bought the whole lot for $2,400. And uh, the portfolio was Sun Kwa label on the interior, right there. And uh, that made this like the buy of the month. All right. Uh, uh, you, you, I would think in this day and age, a really fine Sun Kwa watercolor of uh, butterflies. One of them or two of them would probably bring $800 to $1,000. So somebody got a fantastic buy. Somebody got, really got a fantastic buy. That's all I can say. And uh, then on to this. This was, uh, let's see here. This. This was sort of an interesting thing. We had an inquiry about this um, over the, uh, leading up to the sale. Um, this was um, at uh, Tenmuku Auctions down in Fairfield, New Jersey. And uh, we had a few people ask. They thought that with these, were, you know, are these Kangxi or whatever they are. These are not, these were not Kangxi, okay, in my opinion. These are later copies done with much later bronzes. Um, uh, they look like the classic uh, wall pockets that were done, of course, with the ribbing. Uh, but for a variety of reasons, I didn't like them as Kangxi. I liked them as reproductions from the 20th century or the late Qing dynasty at the earliest. It's hard to tell without taking them apart. But um, uh, if you looked here very carefully and you look at the way the blue enamel appears, the, uh, the way the flowers are done, the way the leaves are drawn and so forth, this yellow, the way it's just sort of dabbed on there, um, the, the, it's, they're lacking the uh, elegance, I think, of a good Kangxi pot. I just, I just don't see it. And uh, they had listed them as Kangxi for some reason. Also, when you get to the bronze work here, these mounts, these are not old mounts. 
the metal work is not finally done. Uh, they're sort of they're sort of stamped, bent, and stuffed on here. And these would be, maybe these this, these mounts could have been done in Egypt, where they do a fair bit of this stuff. There's a few countries that do it, um, and they ormolu mount things. Ormolu mounting is sort of becoming a thing, especially with reproduction. So be very careful. It used to be that if you saw ormolu mounts on a piece, that indicated that it was an antique because ormolu mounting sort of went out of fashion around 1910 and some of the some of the best porcelains to get into Europe from the uh, 18th uh, to the 19th century um, uh, would have ormolu uh, uh, mounts put on them. There is actually, actually there's, a, there's a very good book on ormolu mounted porcelain. I think the British Museum did it or something. It's over in the reference section. It's in the book section on the uh, on the bitamount.com site. Under references, you'll find it. And um, was it porcelain for ormolu? I forget the name of it. But anyway, it's over there. It's over there. And uh, there's a whole thing about ormolu mounts. And what the, what the copyists are learning these days, if you take something that looks like it's early 18th century, add some ormolu and gilt to it and make it look good enough, because most people don't know anything about ormolu or what it should look like, what the, these bronze mounts should look like. All I can say is, this isn't it, all right? This is not what they should look like. Um, it's perfectly fine. They're perfectly decorative. And in the end, I think the crowd figured it out because the pair only went for $750. Had these been a pair of Femi Ver Kangxi pieces with late 18th or early 19th century um, gilt bronze uh, Ormolu mounts on them, uh, I suspect this set would have sold probably six to $10,000. But somebody got a nice looking set of paste for $750. All right, but don't, you know, just as a thing, don't assume because it has Ormolu mounts on it that it's terribly old. All right, just not a good idea. All right, now let's uh, hop over here. Uh, those are some pictures I, when I was looking up, um, uh, I was looking for that rhino horn cup that I showed you initially that brought the 25 million. Was, those are just sample pics I came across while I was looking. All right, now over to uh, the weekly newsletter. Like I said, it wasn't a really, really, really busy week. A number of things did sell pretty well. One of them was this. It was this very nice uh, uh, Qing Dynasty uh, dragon uh, skirt uh, right here. Beautifully done silk, uh, folded silk, greased silk with a dragon here and gold metallic thread. Uh, looked to be in overall nice condition. Uh, minor pole here, which they very nicely pointed out, but the rest of it looked quite good. Uh, nice deep dark blue. There's a little stripping here that needed to be reattached. That kind of you can fix that with a thread and needle yourself, and uh, came out to $1,025, which was a very good price, very strong price for a, a, a Chinese silk skirt, uh, late Qing Dynasty. Very nice. <clears throat> and then on to this. Uh, this was an interesting little thing. It's a gravy boat, chi uh, a China trade gravy boat, obviously late 18th century. And uh, these are interesting forms. If you're a China trade collector, you know right away that these were the uh, types of porcelains that were made that were done to emulate English silver. And uh, if you go and look up uh, English silver of the 18th century, gravy boat, you're going to see this form. And uh, what they did was uh, they made Chinese porcelain to copy those, to copy that shape. With these, with these sculpted sides. They also did, you know, they copied Monteith bowls in China into porcelain. Often they were made originally in silver and, and other materials, and, the, and they, would, they would make them into porcelain. And here you have a gravy boat that was uh, made probably from a silver model and then uh, uh, turned out in porcelain. And they did these fairly often. You find them uh, generally in big dinner services. Uh, the pattern on this is a fairly well-known one, simple uh, uh, peonies and, uh, and uh, some edging. And it uh, went for $222, which I think was a very reasonable price for a nice piece of 18th century porcelain. And one that you can use. You can actually put gravy in these and use these, and I recommend it. S serve your turkey a little elegantly this Thanksgiving. All right, now on to this, the lotus pattern uh, faceted uh, sided plate. Uh, this, was, this was a very, very pretty little plate. I love the fine scroll work all over it. And then this nice big negative space with just a lotus flower and some uh, vines coming out of it in the middle. Very, very pretty. And uh, this uh, sold for uh, $207 which I think was very, which absolutely fine for that. That's an absolutely good price for a nice piece of porcelain. Very, very pretty. And then over here to this was the, the, the uh, Buddha Kuan Yin. This was over in Katariki, late it is late Ming. It's either late Ming or early Qing, somewhere in there, but, but absolutely fine. It's a little bit, it was a little crude around the face and stuff, but it still had traces of gilt lacquer on it and whatnot. 
and uh, let's see what the other side, there it is. And you can see the nose is a little bit crude. You can see where they cut it and cleaned it up a bit. But other than that, it's fine. And it ended up selling for 1,000 euros, which I think is perfectly good, perfectly good price for an old bronze. All right. I think at some point somebody tried to clean this bronze. I just have a feeling uh, sometimes when they look like this and uh, the, the, there's a certain evenness to the surface that somebody might have, might have cleaned it. Uh, not in the last 150 years, but at some point during its life. All right, and then onto this was that magnificent, huge, grizzeye decorated European woman on the Chinese export platter. This was a very unusual platter. This was on Katowiki, and uh, the estimate was uh, two, two or three thousand dollars, which was was very reasonable for this. Uh, this thing was finally, finally, finally done. And uh, if you bring in the enlargements, you get a good idea of, of how good the pen work on this was. Just absolutely stupendous. They did some of, in some of the places, every fiber of the, of the outfit was drawn in an actual line. All right, here's the skyline behind it. There's more pictures, lots of orange peel in the, uh, in the, in the uh, glaze, as you can see. And uh, the back of it is uh, looking exactly how you would want it to look. Um, there it is, all right. And there were nice bits of grit and grunge around the foot rim. Uh, hold on, let's see if we can show that a little better. There, down in here. See this? All those little bits of grit and so forth on the outside. And it's pretty much what you want to see. And it's not a snow white porcelain. It's sort of a grayish white tone to it, which is pretty normal. And uh, this ended up selling for 8,000 euros. So almost $9,000, I guess, is the closest way to put it, U.S. Uh, but it was a, a very rare and unusual thing. And uh, it is the porcelain Marquis uh, Parma Portraits uh, Subject, is how they titled it. I assume the seller did his homework on it. Uh, uh, Parma Louise Elizabeth, Kuching Dynasty, um, Tones of Black and Amber. They didn't call it Grisaille. They probably should have called it Grisaille Decorated. It was also a nice size, too. It was 50, uh, 40, uh, 51 centimeters in length. So it was, it was uh, uh, you know, 18, uh, 18 or so, 16, 17 inches in, in width. Nice looking plate. And then over here to this was that 18th century enamel decorated plate with the, with the lady carrying the basket, the basket of flowers and so forth. Uh, beautifully drawn, beautiful, vibrant, strong colors. Uh, a nice little uh, bit of a uh, little nick off here and here, which is not anything to worry about. I do like the use of lime green in this a lot. I think lime green, especially with the red, uh, look absolutely terrific together. Uh, I really do. I really think they look great together. Nice color combinations. And uh, ended up selling for 254 dollars, 254 euros, which is also perfectly fine for that. It's a very pretty plate. Um, estimates are just estimates, and sometimes I think people just put them up at a certain number to let you know whether if there's a reserve where it's going to be. Uh, but as I mentioned before with the Katowiki listings, for now we're going to stick as much as we can to unreserved items being listed on Katowiki uh, for everybody, because some of the some of the estimates we saw or figured out later are awfully high. Uh, they're getting a little too aggressive, but at any rate. Uh, and then you had this nice Famille Rose hot food pot, late Qing Dynasty. Love the, the little happy Fu Lion on the top here, standing on all fours, sort of barking up at the sky, like, come and pick me up and have dinner. Lift this cover off. And uh, this did pretty well. It brought $977. Hot food pots have come a long way, but they feel this is a Nonya uh, Nionia, Nionia Straits uh, example, which uh, creates a bit more interest in them because of the that attribution. All right, and then hopping over to uh, here. Uh, this is something that's coming up. We're going to get into some, some things that are coming up this week that are sort of interesting that you might like to take a look at. Uh, one of them is this, is this tea dust glazed little snuff bottle. This is a nice old bottle. Most of the, the tea dust glazed pieces you see floating around today are fakes. I don't think this is a fake. I think this is rather charming, actually. Uh, they shaved away the, uh, the, the, gla the glaze and so forth around the mouth. It might have had a stopper with some sort of cap arrangement or something intended for it, but uh, very nicely done. Here's a picture of the top. Looks like the top's been ground back just a little bit, or maybe that was polished for some reason. I'm not sure what. Here's a picture of the bottom of it with that brown wash that you see on tea dust pieces. Uh, here's a side angle of the foot rim looking exactly the way it should look. It's a little bit, a little bit of edge puckering there, right in here and here, sort of pulled back. Uh, rather nice. And uh, 
it's, it's size. It's a two, about little under two and three quarter inches tall. It's up to a grand total of two dollars. Closes in three days. Um, and he says polished the, the, on the top rim. The top rim's been polished. Probably had a nick out of it or something. So they polished it down or it had a chunk of glaze sticking off. But two bucks is the price so far. And I think this is a nice little snuff bottle. And, and you don't see good tea dust glaze snuff bottles that often. They do, they do turn up, but they're not that common. They're not nearly as common as Famille Rose or Celadon, some other color. At any rate, nice little, nice little snuff bottle. And then over here to uh, this, this is coming up. Now, this is not a terribly early piece. What's interesting, though, about it is, is that one, the decoration and drawing is quite good. It's a PRC piece. But what's really nice about it is it's got the fa it's got a factory name on the bottom, okay? Uh, it's Mark China, and then it's got this uh, uh, factory manufacturer mark on it. And for those of you that collect a, a late Republic and PROC pieces, this is the kind of thing you want to pick up. They're not expensive. This is not, we're not talking about big money for this. Um, but this is a nice classic example of some of the nice factory wares that were made about 70 or so years ago uh, uh, in China. And uh, if, if there are a lot of you increasingly are collecting this period, this era. Uh, and uh, this, this is a nice piece from it. And right now it has no bids. It's got three days to go. And the opening bid is 99 cents, okay? I think this is pretty cool. And if you like pieces from this period, um, you like the later stuff, or you're interested in, 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 the, in, in what was going on in China, what was going on in Jing Chen when they were trying to reorganize, you know, the end of the Republic period when things were in disarray. The Chinese government was trying to organize the kilns when they first came in to get some production back in place and uh, how all that was handled. This is a piece from that era. And it's rather nice, rather well done, much better than many other pieces. And um, I, you, know, you might be able to pick it up for 10 bucks. What the heck? Why not? Okay. Uh, the other thing that I saw was this. This is an early 20th century sweetmeat set. But with a very nice, too much lighting when he took his pictures. God, it's a bright light. It's too much light. But uh, this is a, a pure sweetmeat set. It's marked China on the bottom. That's all. All right. But it has these rather nice little enamel inset trays that uh, that appear to certainly appear to be original to the piece, and uh, this is how they would what they would use for serving uh, for meals and so forth. Very attractive. It's you know probably uh, what is this about 18 inches wide, uh, 17 inches wide. Okay, 16 16 one way, 17 the other. Uh, it's up to just $23 and uh, a rather attractive serving piece. That's all I can say. It is 20th century, but it's very nicely done. All right, and then over to this. This was something I just came across. It's a very nice 18th century bowl with an inverted rim on it and these nice flowers floating around the inside of it. And uh, the, seller did, the seller doesn't have any idea how old this is, I don't think, uh, judging by the description. Here's a picture of the back of it. It's clearly 18th century. Um, it has that slight yellowish tinge to the paste, and it's up to just twenty-eight dollars. Ah, excuse me. It ought to go. It ought to get up around the hundred dollars, hundred and twenty-five dollar range. But rather pretty, nice and clean, and look to be in good condition. All right. And then this. This is very nice, and I think it's going to take off. This is ancient um, uh, rhythm rhyme has this. This is a very nice piece of carved rock crystals, or it's, it's almost like smoky quartz. Beautifully done, late Ching, in my opinion. Uh, I, I like this a lot. I really do. Get the pictures to rotate here. Hold on. Uh, nicely, nicely done. Beautiful form. I like the way the legs are applied. I love the little teardrop sort of swoosh handles. The lid is modern. The base is modern and all that. But the body is nice, all right? It's got some old fractures in, in, in the quartz running around the body. Pretty typical. But this looks like the real deal to me. I think it's a nice, nice old uh, carved uh, uh, rock crystal uh, incense burner. It's up to a dollar and a quarter. It has eight days to go. It'll be in the newsletter this week, and I think it's terrific. But d don't let the liver and the lid and the base confuse you about its age. All right, those were just added at some point in the last probably 30 years. Somebody just got a cover and a base for it. Look at the object without the, uh, the, the those two distractions, and I think you'll you'll like it. All right, and this, this is maybe one of the best late 18th century armorial export platters I've seen on eBay in a long time. This is a terrific pattern um, uh, uh, palette, uh, the way it's done. Very strong, very bold out of border. It's got, again, a, a form based on English silver salvers. And it's got this sort of raised ridging around the outside with a shaped rim. 
these uh, beautiful honeycomb patterns going around the inner uh, the cavetto, and then the outer rim, the averted rim, with uh, uh, different different shapes of uh, looks like fruit of some kind. But just just a, a really heck of a nice looking platter. Here's the back of it, and again, lots of kiln grit floating around on the back of this thing. There's an old label that looks completely legit to me. It just says 18th century Chinese low stuffed platter with arms of McDonald. Chinese low stuff is just forget the low stuff part. Uh, that's England. It, it, it's where the stuff was brought in. They get confused. Low stuff was is not low stuff. Most of the time means uh, Chinese porcelain. That's how it was used generally. Don't get confused by that. All right. This is Chinese export porcelain, not English porcelain or English pottery. All right. Here's a picture of the back. Lots of kiln grit. This is a good sized platter. Uh, let's see, it's got, it looks like maybe an old line in the base, but it doesn't go through to the other side. I think it's fine. And this is a rare bird, in my opinion. Uh, and it is 17 and a half inches across, so it's a platter. It's good size, certainly, you know, the, the width of a large charger. And uh, what a thing to put on a wall, all right? And it be, but beautiful quality. This must have been a fabulous service, really, really, really. And then the Rose Mandarin um, Tureen. This is a nice one. It's a little one. And uh, I like it a lot. It's very light. It's very cheerful. I love the, uh, the very bright, strong blue enamels at the bottom. And I like the soft palette all the way around. And then that great big gilded mushroom finial on top with strap handles on each end. Very, very attractive. And uh, what's, what should that bring? That should bring four to $600. Um, but, but who knows? I mean, somebody might pick this up for 250 or 350 all right, it's got five days to go, so we're sort of in the mid-range of the auction. See how that turns out, but but leave a bid on it. Like I said, this will be on the uh, uh, newsletter page this week. All right, now over uh, to this. This closes on Sunday. Is that Kangxi sort of milk white, almost like khaki amon white porcelain uh, dish, uh, but beautifully done with little little uh, sections of flowers popping out. Uh, in different panels all the way around it. And then this central uh, sort of a profusion of uh, lotus pod with flowers coming off of it. And then this aquatic looking background. Very, very attractive dish. Uh, it's up to $228. It closes in, uh, as I said, it closes in two days. So it should bring probably uh, $375 to $450, maybe a little bit more. Because it's a very, very pretty dish. So uh, you want to take a look at that if you're a buyer of that stuff. All right, now, uh, oh yeah, this is coming up. This is the Twin Ducks. We've seen a few of these turn up in the market. Um, there was a couple of these that turned up in Europe not long ago over at Katawiki. And uh, here's, here's another one uh, that came up. It's a very, very pretty pattern with the mortals and figures going around the outer edge and then encircling the, large, the pair of lotuses with two uh, mandarin ducks who are known for mating for life. So you see them often in Chinese uh, artwork is a, is a symbol of fidelity and that sort of thing. And uh, let's see, what's this going to... This is up to $355. I think the last one that went through brought around $570, $650, somewhere in there. So sort of expected to get into that range, I, I would think. All right, and then this, this Swato uh, crack style dish, nice looking export dish, sort of primitively drawn the way these are. But I, I, I like the way the boats are sort of just dabbed in there. And then this crazy looking uh, uh, electrical antenna <laughs> showing in the front. It's not an antenna, but it's part of a uh, uh, temple. But it looks, like, it looks like that now. This is up to $276, closes on Sunday. And it, uh, expect it to uh, jump up to, uh, what, $450, $420 US? Something like that, something like that. And then over to this. This was one of the niftiest pieces of export in the sale, in the sales this week. This is going to be. This will be in the newsletter page on eBay. I don't know the seller. Brocanta Coco Corolos Googleos. I don't know who it is. Forget forget the seller's name. Look at this great plate. A pair of foo lions dancing in among silk balls or different balls and coin symbols and so forth. Very charming, absolutely charming. And as we've seen um, in the past, when you have these uh, fairly standard uh, Ch Chinese export rose medallion or rose mandarin plates made, uh, you know, sometime between 1840 and 1880, um, they just sort of had a static price. Unless you get to pieces where they have very individualized and custom decoration. Some of the decorators over in China sort of took it upon themselves at different times that they were going to give the customer more than what they ordered. And uh, they, they did this kind of thing. 
And this is really sort of an over-the-top, cheeky-looking dish, and uh, especially with those food lions. It's up to $51, and I don't know. If you can buy that for under $250, you are doing great. All right, I, don't, I think it'll go above that. But anyway, it's a very, very pretty plate. All right, and I think that's about it for the week. How about that, huh? Um, if you enjoy the videos, uh, uh, give us a thumbs up. If you have any questions or anything or want to know something, uh, let us know. And if you haven't subscribed to us here on YouTube, please do. We, we love seeing the subscribers come along. And uh, visit us over at bitamountlive.com where things are being sold and uh, getting more and more things every week. And uh, the bitamountlive.com site where you can get information and join the forum and look up old auction catalogs and books and references and go through museum collections and all the, all the links are there right on the home page. All right. Have a great weekend. Uh, it is going to be... What is it today? It's 88 here. It got warm again. It was very cold last week. We all had jackets and sweaters on. Now it's back up in the upper 80s. And uh, I guess we're going to have a bit of weather coming in tomorrow. I don't know what it's going to be, but I don't think it's going to be a sunny, nice day like today is. That's too bad. But it's life in New England. All righty. Have a wonderful weekend to all of you. Uh, and see you all next week. Thank you. Bye-bye.